morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the uh, the freedoms that we enjoy in this country, and we ask that you would help us as Christians to properly understand them, to be good stewards of the uh, the influence that we have in our culture. This morning, as we gather around your word, we ask that you would so enlighten us that we might be good witnesses in our culture for the sake of your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Does anyone want to spend a few minutes talking about a uh, Supreme Court decision last week, or do you want to just shoot right on into Luke? I asked that question yesterday at the beginning of Bible class, and uh, Bible class normally ends at 11.45. It was noon, and we hadn't gotten into the text yet. Um, any interest in um, discussing that? Have you had an opportunity to discuss that as a as a community, would you like to for a minute? Sure. Okay. Um, then I will, uh, I'll begin with a few thoughts and I'll see what you want to have to say. Um, the most important thing that I could do as a pastor is to uh, advise, counsel you how to, how to talk about this with non-Christians. Okay, and, um, and I think it's very important because the, uh, the majority of people who oppose the decision that came down last week, the majority of them believe that it is being forced on them by a, some form of Christianity. That's what they think. Um, so first of all, it's important to remember, and I'm, sh I'm sh probably not educating any of you. Are, are, do we have any legal experts in the room, by the way, that I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of? No? You are? No. no. Okay. I'm not either. I'm a theologian. But I can understand at least this much. All that happened last week was that the Supreme Court d determined that the question of abortion is not a constitutional question. Right? It, it's not a constitutional question. Um, that means that um, st uh, states who want to make it a legal question have to do so independently. So one state will, it'll look one way in one state, it'll look another way in another state. And, uh, uh, you know, the state that we live in right now, um, I think abortion is still legal, um, though I think there are some experts, uh, co expert commentators who would say that that may not last uh, in Georgia. Um, Okay, so that's, that's just very brief. That's about all I'm authorized, qualified to, to comment on, on the legalities going on. Um, what I feel better qualified to say is that as a Christian, as a pastor, as a leader in the Christian community of sorts, um, I want to encourage Christians to be winsome in their engagement of this conversation. What happened last week is not a victory for the church. It is not a victory for the church. And the reason I say that is because the church is not in the business of political battles. It's not our, it's not our calling. It's not our mission. And an individual Christian may be called into politics. And I hope they are. I hope they will be. I want Christians involved in politics. I want Christians running for office. I want Lutherans running for office. Um, and so, as individuals, uh, we can have a political life 
as individual Christians, we, we ought to have political engagement with our, with our political culture. But as a church, as a church, we are not about political battles. Okay, we have we the church can have an opinion uh, of sorts, a, a sort of like a formal opinion, and it would be the formal opinion of uh, of the Christian church that uh, if abortion is murder, it's wrong. Right? That would be a, a that would be a churchly opinion. We know the church is is unequivocal that murder is wrong. It ought to be. A Christian church ought to be unequivocal that murder is wrong. And um, it's generally agreed upon. I mean, it is absolutely established in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that when a healthy mother aborts a healthy child, it is murder. That's, that's a, I would say that's a theological reality. Okay. Um, so... If you're going, here's, here's, here's how I'll wrap up my thoughts, um, and then I'm, I'm open for further dialogue if you care to hear my thoughts, any further thoughts. Um, if you're going to dialogue with people about this, I encourage you to find, um, a, to, 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 to find to attempt to find agreement on one point only. And if you can find agreement on this one point, then the conversation, I suggest, can continue productively. And that one point is, if there is a healthy baby inside of a healthy mother, it should be allowed to live. Now, if, if you're engaged in a dialogue with someone who, who disagrees with the Supreme Court decision from last week, and you agree with the, the decision of the Supreme Court. So if you're entering into a dialogue that is uh, potentially a, you know, a, a, a debate, let's say, um, and you cannot agree that a healthy child inside of a healthy mother ought to be allowed to live, you don't have really much to talk about. Where are you going to go? If you can't agree that a healthy baby inside of a healthy mother ought to be given a chance to live, you, you don't have a conversation. Uh, you, you're, you're, not, you're, gonna, gonna, you're not going anywhere on that. You can't change their mind. You can't. What is there to talk about? <clears throat> now, of course, the cans of worms. What, is, what do you mean by healthy? Okay. Well, you know, that... Great. Can we at least agree that if we can agree on what healthy means, <laughs> that a healthy baby inside of a healthy mother ought to be given life? If we can agree on that, now we can, get, we can go to the second step and, and start to, to talk about what, you know, what is a healthy baby and what's an unhealthy baby, what's an unhealthy mother, what, and what, is, what is, you know. So then you can get into the complexities of the situation. But I, my suggestion is if you can't gain agreement on that one thing, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't last long in that conversation. I'd try and shut it down. I, I mean, I would try and exit is what I mean. I, I wouldn't want, to, I would just say, hey, I, I don't think I, I don't think I want to debate this with you. I, I just don't want to. I, I, I don't think it's going to be fruitful. Uh, what are your thoughts, Gene? Well, the thing that has baffled me a little bit is not my discussion with non-Christians, but my discussion with those that claim to be Christian and uh, would disagree with the comment that a healthy baby and a healthy mother should be allowed to live. That it's, it's, mm -hmm. They still are saying it is a right mm -hmm. to abort, uh, for a woman to make a decision to abort right. a healthy baby just because. Right. And I think, so I think, so the, the, the <clears throat> for the sake of, me. yeah, for the sake of the Facebook audience, the, the point was made that, that there are folks, you know, there are uh, Christian folks who, uh, who, uh, who want the who want abortion to remain a right, 
who want women, healthy women with healthy babies in their womb to have the choice to abort it. And my, my, I would suggest to you that if you run into someone like that, that first point that I made would be particularly useful as a place to begin. Because with a Christian, you have the greatest chance of gaining agreement on that first point. You ought to anyway. I mean, there are other, there are other, there are, there are non-Christian cultures that have a, a pretty high value of, of human life, but um, uh, among Christians, it should be, it, sh it should be a fairly productive conversation. To, to, so you could ask them well, t before we, before we, uh, before we discuss whether or not a, a access to an abortion ought to be a right for a healthy mother with a healthy baby, can we first, can you first explain to me why a healthy baby and a healthy mother ought not to be given the opportunity to live? Convince me of that. Convince me that there's any higher purpose than that, and, and I'm, I'm with you. So you can, you, you keep, if, if we can keep the conversation on that um, we have a chance to have a productive dialogue. And that's really all that we're, we're interested in, is dialogue. And remember, our ultimate purpose as a church is to point people to the forgiving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if we end up living in a state, or even a country, because the Congress could figure out a way to make it law too. If we end up living in a country or in a state where uh, abortion is defined as a right, the church will not suffer. Individuals will. Babies will. Mothers who, who abort them will suffer. Um, families will suffer. All kinds of people will suffer. And suffering is the very context of the gospel. So the church will thrive either way. The church thrived underground in, in communist Russia, and hey, maybe that's God's will for the church in the United States of America someday. I don't know. Well, it's thriving underground in uh, China. China. Yeah, sure. So, mm -hmm. What else? Anything else on this topic? Yes. I was a counselor for a Christ-based pregnancy center. Really? In Georgia for about five years. Really? Mm -hmm. I would ask them to go to a life base, a Christ based mm -hmm. center, and they would present the various options. Mm -hmm. And they help them all the way through past birth and years after. Mm -hmm. um, I also would recommend that you refer to someone to your pastor because um, the, the, you, you have a path. I, I can say this to you because I know your pastor. You have a pastor who will do a tremendously good job of meeting a, a, a woman a, a in, who's in a crisis pregnancy situation. You have a pastor who knows exactly how to meet that person with love, with the gospel, with tenderness, mm -hmm. and with you know compassion, and with an awareness of resources and what have you. So don't forget to suggest, hey, I... He, I would love for you to talk to my pastor because um, he's just he has a he has a wisdom on this subject that you you know you won't lose by talking to him you know that kind of thing um, and then people like you who who are trained whew, what a resource I'm glad to know that you're here so yeah uh, try and avoid the quippy one-liners. Like, gee, only people that got bo only people that have been born can support abortion rights. I mean, yes, there's all kinds of zingers that, yeah, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of zingers that people can can use. Don't. Just don't. Just avoid acrimonious speaking, and uh, be winsome in in your in your testimony. For one, that that sounds good. It, it is a gift from God. Um, 
and once they, you know, they see on the ultrasound that the, the embryo is actually a, a child. A yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's an effective tool. Yeah, uh, hugely effective. Yeah. Just a moment. Um, another thing that you, know, you bring up a good point, the child is a gift. One thing, one voice that we need more of in our culture is the positive voice of motherhood. We hear all kinds of voices about how motherhood is a drag and it's a, a you know, it's a burden and it's blah, 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 and children are a burden. Um, I want to hear more women ta talking about the joy of mother, the gift, the, the, the blessing of motherhood. How, what an incredible uh, life altering joy it is to bear a child and to, you know, um, of course, and I don't know why this has been so poorly promoted, but adoption is, I mean, it's why I'm here. Let me tell you, we're trying to adopt somebody in this country. It's, it's hard. Yeah. It's easier to go overseas. That's right. And I don't know what that's all about, and I think maybe there, that's something that could be worked on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to make a comment on the, um, I like what, how you said what you said, because I find myself getting trapped into the what ifs and right. with, with people who are right. just combative yeah. when the conversation starts. So that's fine. I'm so willing to. Yep, I'm saying. willing to have the conversations about the what ifs with anyone who's willing to agree that a healthy child inside of a healthy mother ought to be allowed to live. Once we can agree, agree on that, then I'm more than willing to engage in the what ifs with that person, because now I know that that person's motive, at least, is um, is generous towards the situation, rather than a person who's merely trying to defend some phantom constitutional right that the court has determined doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the guilt that the woman that does go through an abortion carries with her for a long time. Right. And I also found that. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, so that's totally true. Now I think that there are some women that are cold as cold as towards as it, as it and, and it yeah. Most of them it's with them. My parents did not. Uh, my parents adopted three of us. Uh, my older brother, who died a couple years ago, my, myself, and my younger sister. Incidentally, my mother was adopted as well. <laughs> you know, so we have all that going on. Um, uh, but uh, they did not, and this was, you know, these adoptions took place in the 60s when th there was no access to the birth parents. Uh, it was guarded as a protected as a kind of a thing. Um, so, uh, so, so there's that. Uh, but t I think you're right today, the adoptions are far more generally open, what, th what they refer to as open adoptions. I, I can't decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, honestly. Um, I'm thankful for what I had. I'm thankful that my mom and dad are the only mom and dad I, I, I care about as mom and dad. I, I don't have any thoughts or emotions toward my birth mom and dad. I don't even think of them as such. Um, and yeah, and I'm, but I'm not angry towards them either, see? I, I don't, I'm not burdened with anger towards them for whatever it was that resulted in my being born and not kept. I don't care. Um, God cared for me. There's so many people that would love to raise a child, to have a child, uh -huh. that for whatever reason can't. Yeah, I know. And, and I, I mean, I know of a couple right now who's going through the, whatever, the surrogate kind of business that they do and, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and the, the, all of the madness, the scientific madness that goes into that um, with a surrogate, a, 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 a third party carrying the, the baby and it's just so bizarre and it's like, well, here's a baby. <laughs> <laughs>
this one could be born and you could have her and love her um, rather than kill her. I guess that's, see, that's the part that really bothers me. And when you make it into law, as Roe v. Wade did, a, is the fact that it's a genocide. And if you look at the stats, there have been more babies killed than in all the wars we fought. Yeah, that's right. Right, so when, um, I, there's a, here's a situation that I have some knowledge of, and I'm going to use it as a, an example of what we in the church now will, could hopefully, in a sense, hopefully face. Um, in, uh, in the uh, uh, early 19th century, for like 30 years in England, Christians fought like heck to end slavery. And it was, it, the, it, this followed uh, what was known as the Great Awakening in, in, in England. Many, an in, a, 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 a drastic increase in the number of people going to church. And they started to look at their culture and say, you know, how can we apply this gospel to the culture that we live in? And they saw slavery for what it was. And so they they began working and working. At one point, they even had a, they generated a petition that was signed by a full half of the citizens in England. And Christians did that. The opposition at the time, and this has happened over the course of 30 years in the early 19th century, um, the opposition at the time sa said that in, to free the slaves would be Economic suicide. One one um, legal com commentator at the time called it econocide. It would be it would be econocide for them to, to free the slaves, which is true. Um, in particular, the the price of sugar would shoot way up because the the extensive use of slavery in the colonies, harvesting sugar cane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was all kinds of um, of concern about how could, could we possibly absorb the freeing of the slaves economically, and it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't conceived of how it could happen. Yet the Christians continued and continued and continued, and in a sense, they had the Christians had zero to gain economically and everything to lose. Finally, thirty years thirty years in, they. The, the, Parliament passed the law, which the emancipation of the the slaves in in the British, uh, you know, the kingdom, and uh, some exorbitant amount of money was subsidized to the slave owners who were losing their slaves. Right out of the British treasury, that money came and went straight to those uh, former slave owners. In other words, justice has a cost. Do you understand? Justice, in that case, a very obvious case where justice had an economic cost, that the church must be willing to acknowledge, support, and pay if it's, if it's going to be serious about what it means to protect human life. So um, if the moral battle over abortion is to be won, it's going to be an expensive victory financially. And that we need to be okay with that. Do, do you understand that? Right? Yeah. I don't see any other way. I don't. I don't see any other way around it. You can't just stand up and say, "Well, you conceived the child. Go get a job." Okay, go get a job. That. What does. What pro, You know. How, does that really solve the problem? It, it helps, but it's not. It's not going to solve the. It's not going to fully solve the problem. And so I think there's going to be, not just probably not just economic, but there's going to be all kinds of social cost. If this moral victory is going to stick, 
um, if abortion is going to remain illegal, as it should, um, with, at least with respect to a healthy baby inside of a healthy mother. I mean, I'm not talking about ectopic pregnancies and all. I don't want to get into that, right? You know. I think one. Of, I think it was Janet Teller, one of the ladies in the government, used that as a pro abortion, mm -hmm. saying that but it the was cost, cost too just much. the cost, right? Too much, and yeah. So therefore, that was the reason for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, ethicists have have debunked that kind of thinking long ago, um, but it's be, they're it's they're being ignored. You know, um, again, it was the same thing in this country. I just don't have my facts straight about the ending of slavery in this country. I know there was a cost to it here too, but I don't have the, my I don't have, I haven't done the research. I've done the research on the the the, the other one. Yeah, that's you right. That's right. That's right. It's super duper important right now for every interested Christian church to have really good lines of communication with support centers to have really good support flowing into those crisis pregnancy centers or how, whatever they're called. I call it crisis pregnancy. That's because that's what we called it in New Jersey. What do they call it around here? Would, would that, that term would work, crisis pregnancy? Um, I, I just, it's it's uh, incumbent upon the church to be prepared for the fallout of what our culture does. And this is a big change in our culture. It's not going to hit Georgia yet, so we have time to prepare. But as soon as the state of Georgia makes it illegal, we're, we're going to hopefully experience the fallout locally. Yes? There is a center here right. now that will try to... Good. Um, well, Meet, just a second. Take, take the responsibility upon yourself to call them, educate yourself, find a name, know, have, know a person's name who works there. So that if you, yeah, good. So that, I'm talking to everybody, not just you, not just singling one person out. Take it upon yourself to know the name of a person who works at these places. Have their phone number. Ask for their personal phone number so that in, so that you you're prepared for the moment that might come. Yeah, uh, uh, gee. Well, Peter, we're well connected with that when we support it as part of our mission efforts. Yeah. And other, Pastor Dave is on the board. Yeah, that's spectacular. That is as it should be. So we are, we're very well connected with the women's yeah. center. I have personal experience <clears throat> with a pastor of another denomination in our area. That probably could not answer the question. I wouldn't have a problem answering the question. I was on the mission committee, and we interviewed. The mission committee gave out a few hundred dollars every year to various um, organizations in the counties. <clears throat> and one of them was the Women's Enrichment Center. And um, the director came and gave a presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And um, when she was, they brought her back in after we discussed it and listened to all the others and um, they wanted another question and the question he asked her was is in your mind is abortion wrong in all cases and she of course said yes and so because of that he, he was he was very upset mm -hmm. and he um, well that you know he, he, he could not see that that was her position but on the other hand there were lots of other people that they were helping that needed to be helped and mm -hmm. so Based on his decision and three others in the group, they decided not to fund this organization anymore mm -hmm. because of their position. Could, could it be that it's uh, uh, at times a necessary wrong? In other words, could it be a, 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 a choice between wrong and wrong sometimes? I mean, that's a possibility. When you get into these really, really niche cases where the, the line, the, it's all gray. There's no black and white left because you've got 
all kinds of complications and this, that, and the other thing. And that now you've got a situation where you, 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 you're, in a sense, damned if you do and damned if you I, don't. I There's where we need to be kind of a little bit squishy uh, around the fr very fringes of our practice. Right, yeah. See, before I ever talk about those fringe cases, I want to get that basic agreement that if... Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I'm sorry that there are... Pa you're right, there are pastors. I know of them, too, that, that you know, they're, they're out there protesting right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. For 50 years, the uh, Christians have had to live peacefully in a country where policy was something that they radically disagree with. And for 50 years, Christians have peacefully engaged this subject. I know there's been some outliers and some wackos who've done some stupid things um, opposing uh, the abortion. But for the most part, the Christians, and, and in particular the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, has been very peaceful and thoughtful in its engagement of the subject over the years. And so if anyone's watching, <laughs> you know, and being honest, um, we've been a good witness in terms of how to oppose um, policy that you disagree with, right? We've, we, we, that's been a good witness. The, the people who are opposing it right now, loudly in the streets and burning and whatever, that's not a good witness, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I don't know why I bring that up. Yes? There will be illegal Okay, so that's the next and subject. Yeah, mothers. yeah, that's going to happen too. Um, the the uh, the point was just made that um, there will be illegal abortions that take place mm -hmm. in states where abortion is is illegal, and um, uh, Again, the church needs to know how to handle that too and how, how to have a witness and a testimony about that. If that's what takes place, you know, again, there's nothing uh, outstanding about the sin of murder that's any different than any sin that anyone in this room is guilty of this morning. There's nothing outstanding about it. Gentleness. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Speaking of scripture, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, you know, engaging that. I'm sure we could continue, but uh, I do want to do some justice to the text here. Um, the text that we covered uh, two weeks ago, we, we didn't meet last week, Monday, did we? No. Right. Um, the text that we covered two weeks ago, we read the triumphal entry, and we read... I believe we read uh, briefly um, verses 41 through 44 of chapter 19 in Luke. Um, I'll be, we'll begin with the triumphal entry in mind, right? Jesus riding in. With that in mind, let's continue with the text from 41 to the end of the chapter, and it would be... Um, I mean, Pastor Weshi covered these these topics rather well. So I don't think so. I, I, I think he ended uh, with 40. Oh, okay. All right. Well, well we're going to pick it up in 41. And uh, I'm, it's, you know, kind of the, the first paragraph of chapter 20 is super important, too, about in, in this context. 
and we'll see. Maybe I'll just make oblique reference to it. Um, but let's get to this text right now. Let's have a reader, 41 through the end of the chapter. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that even you had known this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. You know, if you stopped the Gospel of Luke right there, you'd say, oh, that was a good ending. Yeah. Right? That, that, that was a good ending. He made it to Jerusalem all Luke long. We've been waiting to get to Jerusalem. He's made it to Jerusalem. He's cleansed the temple. Nobody can do anything wrong, and he's in the temple teaching. End of the end. Right? That'd be a happy ending for this story. <laughs> but that is not what Luke is writing about, is he? Um, right. So, uh, but that is, it's interesting to note that um, from a, uh, if you remove the, 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 the doctrine of the vicarious atonement for sin, if you remove the, atone, the atoning sacrifice, the importance of that, the primacy of that, um, you could really end the story here and, and be quite content with what Luke has written. Um, but cl clearly, we as Christians can't be content. This is where I mean, the Socinians stop. What's that? This is where the Socinians stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, so a uh, couple things. Uh, first, like I said, remember, uh, we're, dealing this, we're dealing with this in the context of the triumphal entry. This is all part of the same story. Um, Jesus has just, and we pointed this out, he has just, um, uh, he's just come into Jerusalem riding on a an, uh, previously unridden uh, colt, a, a tiny horse, a tiny horse, a baby horse. He looks like Sancho Panza coming into to Jerusalem. And, and it's like, I think he does this on purpose. Because he, I mean, he's not coming in on a war horse to liberate Jews from Rome. He is the high and mighty king who is absolutely accessible. He is the powerful lord of the universe who is absolutely meek. So there's this dual message, this kind of paradoxical message that Jesus communicates as he enters into Jerusalem. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to just land on that, the pun intended, land on that, that horse for a moment, uh, because there was a, a few thoughts I had in the intervening weeks that I, I didn't say last time because I didn't think of it. But we did talk about how this was an unbroken animal. So we, we know what happens when a human being gets on an unbroken horse, right? But that doesn't have. But does Jesus break this horse? No. No. So what happens? What happens when Jesus gets in the saddle? He doesn't break the horse. What happens to the horse? What causes a horse to buck and... Because they don't like the weight on it. They're afraid. They're afraid. Like, so when Jesus hops in the saddle, he doesn't break the horse. He dispels its fear. It, it's, now, just let that sink in because it, it's, this, it's the same thing for us. 
And I think we, you know, we, all human beings have a tendency to buck a little bit over the authority of, of God in our lives, over Jesus' authority. But Jesus is the only thing in the universe that can control you without breaking you. Um, that can control that is that can control you, or that you know that can have authority over you without destroying you, without ruining you. That can have authority over you and fulfill you at the same time, right? So uh, just kind of a little teaching moment there uh, from the from the the little moment on the horse. Um, and uh, and then he says, I tell you, if these if uh, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. We observed last time um, that that is a theme in Scripture. I think I quoted from Psalm. I quoted from Isaiah. Um, if I, if I, at least I intended to. Um, where yeah, I think I did. Where we see this theme that all of creation exalts the lordship, the kingship of Jesus Christ, um, uh, and we actually see it happening here in the life of this little this little cult. Where you know there's something about the 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 returning the the king has arrived, right? And uh, what we didn't mention two weeks ago was that this is now what is happening here is a fulfilling of one of the probably the most ancient prophecy in in the world, and that is that of Genesis three uh, three fifteen, where in a sense it's like. It's almost like the last, it is, the last, uh, it's God's last word, unmediated un, um, word to man. Like when he says to, to Adam and Eve, um, you know, that's Adam and Eve fa face to face with God, hearing him directly face to face. And, and um, uh, so in a sense, God is addressing all of humanity one to one, face to face, and and the, like the, his last words before, you know, uh, before his word from there for, thereafter needs to be mediated through Moses or through Scripture, or whatever. Um, his his word is there. My, the king will come and he will slay the dragon and he will you know. Uh, and so here now the king is coming and he's coming to slay the dragon. Um, and uh, and and the rocks and the trees and the horses and 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 what does that mean for you? And if there's anything you could ever remember when you're having a bad day, it's this: that under the lordship of Jesus Christ, if the rocks and trees are going to cry out in joy, what what does that mean for you? You know, and I think that's comfort for a bad day. It's. Right, there's all kinds of garbage that's going to take place, but there's that the king is going to return. See, you know, and all these myths that that have sprung up ever since, and uh, you know, the famous English language myth is uh, you know the King Arthur myth, right? You know, remember the the. the um, I don't know if you know it well, uh, but uh, in, in in the King Arthur mythology, you know what it says on his on his gravestone? Uh, it says, "What's that?" So it's yes. It says, uh, "See if I can remember it in Latin." Uh, rex quandum rex futurus, the once and future king. So there's, and, and that's not just the only one, there's all kinds, you know, the, the Tolkien mythology, there's Germanic languages uh, mythology, there's Babylonic, Babylonic mythology, you know, there's all Greek, all these myths where you have this theme of a king, a returning king to conquer. Um, there, there's something in the human psyche that demands to be ruled we are created to be ruled by a king. Do you understand that? It's hard for Americans to understand because we threw out the monarchy for political reasons, you know, and, you know, monarchs are bad. Human monarchs are all, always bad. But like C.S. Lewis said, um, the, uh, like the physical nature, the spiritual nature, 
uh, cannot be denied. Uh, uh, deny it food and it will gobble poison. So we don't have... Um, uh, we don't have kings in this country, but instead we, we have celebrities. We have movie stars and sports stars and, you know, race car driving stars. And, you know, we have those kind of wealthy. We have, we have our, our, our version of monarchy in, in you know, kind of ca on a capitalistic kind of way. Um, because it is a human. Do you understand? It's a part of our created nature to be ruled Yeah, I'm, that's that's sad. But it's that's what happens when he when, in in the absence of of rulership. Yeah. So I mean, we need it. We desperately need it. And I mean, I know you know. Like, but anyway. But so, um, but there's only one ruler. There's only one king who can have sovereign authority over you without destroying you, and that is King Jesus. Just, just as an aside. Uh, the way we train horses now, yep. as opposed to breaking them, you train them. Oh, okay. And, and you don't break horses anymore. Oh, is that you so? Find, you find that if you teach your horse to do what you want it to do because it wants to do it, mm -hmm. it does a better job at where the right. herding cows or are racing in an arena. So they have a different approach to just getting on it and waiting till the bucking I, stops. I've done it both ways, and it's sort of. It takes a lot longer to do it the new way, right. but you get a better animal when you finish. That's great. And God gets a better animal than us. Yeah, that's true. Because... Yeah, because he doesn't God break God. us either. He yeah, he doesn't break, break us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He engages us. That's a sermon there, Gene. Why don't you get to work on it? Um, so, that, so then you get to this, uh, this, this little piece where uh, Jesus, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things from this because I, I don't want you to miss it. He says, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Let me paraphrase. You, Jerusalem of all cities ought to know. Why is he so insistent upon Jerusalem of all cities? that ought to know what makes for peace. Exactly. I mean, and if you track that mountain through backwards through the Old Testament, all of the things that God made happen there, all of the promises that God has applied to that, that, that hill, all of, yes, you're, you nailed it. Of course, exactly. Of all cities, of all hills, of all places, of all peoples, you... You, that you should not know what makes for peace is crazy. Um, and uh, and it, um, it, it, it says that Jesus is weeping. So uh, his emotional engagement here is at a peak. Um, but now he says the days, are, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Don't skip over that. What's that? Good, I won't. And this is one of the reasons why I want to make sure we don't miss that first paragraph, chapter 20. So I'll tell you what, I'll quickly read it now, because we'll probably get back into it in a week. But one day as Jesus was teaching uh, the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us, by what authority you do these things, or who it is that you gave this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? They discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Do you hear the similarity between that text and this sentence um, where Jesus says, uh, But now they are hidden from your eyes. I alluded to it two weeks ago when I said that Jesus is forcing the issue here in Jerusalem. Crown me or kill me. 
There's no middle ground. There's no, I like Jesus. Either Jesus is your, either either he's on the saddle of your life, um, or he's being trampled underfoot. But he is not walking along, so he's not your co-pilot. Jesus will not be liked. He will be either loved or left. Right. Right. So what Jesus, Lisa, what Jesus is doing here is he's forcing the issue. He's forcing the issue of his lordship. And if you can't observe his lordship, then he's forcing you to kill him. So that he can die for that. He he want he doesn't want to. He must die for, for your rejection of him. Um, and that's why he wept when he was. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's why he wept. Yeah, yeah. I think he. Yeah, I know. I mean, he he's weeping for. Um, for the for the yeah for the mm-hmm. yeah for the rebellion for the ignorance for the right for the hatred for the yeah uh, for the days will come upon you when your enemies uh, will set up a barricade around you surround you uh, hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children within you um, interesting there and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Um, I'm going to make brief comments here. Um, Number one, many theologians have uh, endeavored to make connections, prophetic connections here to the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, Yet, my problem with it is that I I doubt that that's all Jesus is doing. (laughs) It's not Jesus' game to show up and make predictions about the, you know, like parlor like Nostradamus, you know, oh, in 13 years. That, true, this happened to Jerusalem in a very real way. So there is a, ful- a, a fulfillment here of this. But if you'll, be, if you'll be willing to read what he said here uh, as a, pro- a, a prophetic utterance in the, in the fashion of the Old Testament prophets, um, in, this, in such a way that these these utterings are c- continuing to become true. This, he's describing the state of our world until his return, right? He is, he is, he is pointing the people's eyeballs forward to a time when the only hope that you have is his lordship, right? And yeah, there, there are some interesting specific connections there, uh, especially, eerie connections and your children within you. That's kind of eerie. Um, anyway, the thing that I want to especially not miss is that word visitation. And that is the word for a pastor in the New Testament. It's the word that gets translated overseer, which is where we get our theology of pastor. So what what is his visitation? What is Jesus doing in Jerusalem? He's pastoring them. He's he's fulfilling his... And I think... Uh, I, I'm, I, I forgot to ask uh, Dave, Pastor Weshi, if this was what he was doing, but I think one of the themes that Pastor Weshi was trying to develop last or two weeks ago was how in, this, in these texts, Luke is developing the prophet, priest, and king motif of Jesus Christ. And so I got to finish his point because I think he was, I'm pretty sure he was driving in that direction. Um, and if he wasn't, then he was, you know, then he was inspired because it sure sounded like it. Um, and it's right there. I mean, it's very, very, very obvious. Um, prophet, priest, and king going on here um, with that. 
Finally, then he enters the temple. So what Jesus does when he comes to Jerusalem is he goes not to the courthouse, not to the palace, right? He doesn't even go to the, he, he goes to the temple. I mean, this shouldn't surprise us, um, but, uh, but it, we need to remember it, uh, that that is the, where the work gets done. That's where the pastoring work gets done. And, I don't, and I'm not focusing on myself as pastor. I mean, that's where the ministry, the pastoral ministry that we're all engaged in. I mean, you, you, you are, in a sense, engaged in pastoral ministry by, by your participation in the church. The church exists for, for the sake of pastoral, I should say that almost with a lowercase p, pastoral ministry. For, for it, here, it, here it is. The church exists for the sake of visitation in the same way Jesus means it in, in, his, in his arrival in Jerusalem. The church, that's the ministry that continues in the church. The church is the incarnational presence of Jesus Christ in Blairsville. It is, it is the presence of Jesus Christ. Literally, in the, I mean, the closer you get to the altar, <laughs> um, the nearer the literal presence of Jesus Christ is, to, to the extent where he is physically present in body and blood, in, uh, in with and under the bread and wine, right? But he's, he is present as well as you're dispersed into community. Um, you're being dispersed into community as members of, of the visitation of the church. And, uh, um, and so he goes into the temple. What does he drive out? What does he cleanse from the temple? Stuff. Yeah, right. But, okay, what are they selling? They're selling animals. So in, in cleansing the temple of the robbers, he's also cleansing the temple of those sacrifices. Is he not? And then what does he replace them with? Right. It says Luke makes a huge point of it. He was teaching daily in the temple. So he, he arrives in the temple. He cleans it out of all these animal sacrifices. And he sets himself up as the sacrifice. And if you're reading Luke, and I mean this in a different way that we're, than the way we're reading Luke in, in here on Monday mornings. Luke did not write his book so that pastors Weshi and Sparling could take 12 verses a week and, uh, you know, and dissect them. He wrote his book so that you could sit down and over two hours read it start to finish. Do that sometime. Do it multiple times. Like, make a practice of it. Read the whole thing, start to finish. And if you do that, what you're gonna sit, what's going to jump off the page is, oh, this is not the first time Jesus has been in the temple. What was the first time? What was the last time? The other time, I could say, in Luke's gospel, the only other time Jesus was in the temple. Luke. He was 12 years old. Yeah. What's going on in the life of a 12-year-old boy when his father takes him to the temple? What's going on? He's coming of age. Right, right. So what's, let's imagine. Now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get a little bit uh, creative here for a moment because I, 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 mean, I want to I flesh this out uh, in a way that maybe helps us to read the text as if we're reading it 2,000 years ago. Okay? Um, Imagine what's happening with Joseph and Jesus as they're uh, walking around in Jerusalem as Jesus is having his little coming of age moment with Joseph, right? What, what kind of conversations are taking place? How is Joseph educating his son? You know, I put, put the best construction. How is Joseph educating his son in, in, in Jerusalem? What's he showing him? What's he saying to him? Here's the temple. What, here's the priest. Here's what the priest does. There are, Daddy, why are there animals in the temple? Well, let me explain to you why there are animals in the temple. These animals are blah, 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 blah. And he's going through all this stuff. Then what happens after, after Joseph finishes explaining all this stuff to Jesus? What happens next? He remains in the temple. He remains in the temple. Here's what I imagine. Now, I'm, be, I'm getting super creative, folks, so forgive me if this is a little bit... But I'm imagining 
Oh, and what, is, what does Jesus say to Joseph after Joseph comes back and says, what in the world are you doing? How did you not know I would be in my father's house? I'm about my father's business. And Joseph's like, well, father, I'm your father. No, 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 no. So here's what's happening. Joseph thinks he's walking Jesus around Jerusalem. But I'll tell you who was really walking Jesus around Jerusalem, his actual father. And he was saying, you see those animals? You think those animals can pay for the sacrifice of the people's sins? No. You see those priests? You think they're holy enough to do the thing? No. You know, I'll tell you who's going to really do it. It's going to be you. And Jesus. And now it's almost like a repetition of the... Uh, it's almost like Luke gives it to you at 12, and now he gives it to you the week before Jesus is about to fulfill it. Yeah. Well... Didn't Jesus, when he was 12, he went to the temple on his own accord because his parents didn't know where he was at. And they were worried about it. Well, they didn't know where he was at when they, when, 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 they, yeah, when they left. But the question is, what were they, why, why was that, what was special about that visit to Jerusalem? And, it, and it's, you know, the, the age of Jesus is mentioned. That's my point. Yes, you're agreeing with me. Yeah, you're agreeing with me. But I think he was also getting taught by his earthly father. Because that's what was that's what took place in the life of a twelve year old Jewish boy. Kind of know we kind of know what that looked like. So we know that's that was going on. But I'm ex suggesting along with you what else was going on. That not only was Jesus hearing his Joseph's voice, he was hearing his, his heavenly father's voice. And, and, and according to scripture, they were amazed at how much he knew. That's right. Yeah, where do you learn that? <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's, that's good stuff there. And... Um, uh, and so, yeah, so I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see not only does he, it's not, it's not that he's, he's cleansing the temple of corruption. He's cleansing the temple of these, uh, these sacrifices that are going to be no longer necessary. And so, in that sense, what does Jesus mean when he says, it, my house would be a house of prayer, not a den of robbers? What are they thieving? What are they robbing the people of? Yeah, yeah, right. They're robbing the people of the gospel. They're robbing the people of the gospel. These people have to pay for their forgiveness. It's not that I don't think in a narrow sense that Jesus is saying you're robbers because you're charging too much for a, for a pigeon. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I think what Jesus means when he says, my house is a house of prayer, not a house of, of robbery. I think what Jesus is saying is the gospel is free. Well, he talks about somewhere, he's talking about the priests, the Pharisees, you know, woe to you, you won't go in, maybe forgetting those that would from going in. He kind of, I kind of see that happening. Mm hmm. Yep. But uh, chapter 19 closes with this little picture. It's almost idyllic. You know, Jesus is in the temple teaching, and the people are hanging on his every word. And, you know, Luke, maybe Luke is a, uh, a pretty masterful uh, author. You know, maybe Luke leaves, leaves us with that little moment um, because things are going to turn. People are not going to be hanging on his every word uh, f f a week from now. It's not just the people, but the priests are hanging on his every word. Uh, it's amazing, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, there, are, there, are, there are forces at work that want him gone. And, and I think that's, what, that's my, the, one of the points that I'm making is that um, Jesus has now, uh, he's made the clear delineation between uh, love me, or kill me. kill me. Because the very next text, the kill me people show up. 
And this t- and the end of 19 is the love me people. You know, he, 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 the king has arrived. There is a proper response to the kingship of Jesus. That is to hang on his every word. And then there is the only other available option, which is to completely oppose him. Because, there, because that's the only option he offers. Jesus cannot simply be a cool guy who said groovy things. Because it, the, his things weren't groovy. He claims, the, the claims that he makes about himself require him to either be the king of the universe or a, a despicable, a despicable charlatan. Let us close in prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge your lordship, your kingship, uh, and we confess that uh, we don't always, we guard parts of our lives from your kingship. Forgive us and uh, reclaim that territory, Lord, in your name, and uh, make us uh, fully uh, yours uh, so that we might, um, you know, so that we might be instruments of your peace in a, uh, in a very volatile culture. We give you thanks for your word this day, and we ask uh, that you would continue to bless us throughout this and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And that ends that. Let me get...